it is very complicated to be innovative in that core. I think a lot of things have been done. And I think playing with a structure or putting something that is that people won't expect, I think this is where it gets interesting. It is difficult not to be influenced by very many horizons because they basically created a shore, uh, in my humble opinion. So yeah, we, we try not to, of course, we are getting a lot of inspiration from them, but of course, I'm always trying to focus. So I shouldn't, I must not sound like, um, like <laughs> Remake Horizon. We have never recorded the vocals of any songs with Max sitting next to me. So what? meaning Max is at this point because he's, he lives in Normandy, in Caen. He is in his studio. He connects to my session with um, this VST Connect, and we record all the vocals like this. So over we, the internet? Over the internet. That's crazy. That's actually yeah. blown my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have only recently been introduced to this band by the name of Revnoir. And in fairness, I believe they've only been a band for a very short amount of time. They've released four songs of their own thus far, plus one collaboration with Young Zyme and Viper. And the quality of the songwriting and the music production and the music videos has been so high that I'm fascinated to find out more from the guitarist, songwriter, and producer, Julian. So thank you very much for joining me today. And to start with, is it right that what the internet's saying that the band has only been around since September of last year? And if so, how did they come to be the band that is now Rev Noir? First of all, thank you for having me, Steve. So cool. Pleasure. Um, Yes, so we've been a band from September 1st on, I think, yes. So a bit more than six months. But the thing is, we've been preparing things like in the shadow, can we say that? Uh, for almost 18 months, I would say, before we released the oh, first wow. track, Bang Bang. Yeah. A year and a half, that's a lot of prep. Why, why yeah. so long for the preparation? Um, so we've been a bit, b before Revenoir, we've been a band for 10 years with an, a, another band called Merge. It was like uh, post-hardcore. Um, eternity. We, we, we went through different genre of music, I would say, but it was like the essence was post hardcore. So we, we had, um, we knew how to write music in the former style, but we knew that we were evolving also. And at some point when we started to, rec to create new songs for merge, we figured out that it wasn't, it wasn't like what we were supposed to do for merge. So we asked ourselves, so sh maybe should we start fresh something new? Because the sound is definitely more heavy. I would say it's, we want to add more electro. We want to have a darkest, um, I don't know, atmosphere, I would say. So yeah, we, we spent two or three months asking ourselves if we wish we should not like start fresh. And we actually said, yeah, we decided to, to, yeah, start Interesting. fresh. Yeah, the way you've worded that, you said we it, it's the new sound you were starting to get to should not be in merge. Was that how you yeah. felt about it, or was that how other folks were kind of indicating to you? We all felt that, but maybe a piece of information that you didn't have. So we kind of stopped merge uh, after the festival season in 2018 okay. uh, because we were just tired after almost yeah it was like six or seven years. Uh, we were quite quite tired after that. So we kind of parted ways with, um, so Max, Kaz and I, so Max is a singer, Kaz is a drummer and myself. We basically said, so yeah, let's put that on hold getters or something. I don't know how to call that. For yeah. two years then, two, three years, I started a pop band, like a Fun. dark, dark pop. Um, yeah, I don't know. I wanted to do something new. I wanted to experiment like my, improve my producing skills uh, with electro and stuff. So. For three years, I mainly focused on this band and Kaz was part of the band, but we were singing, we, we, we had another singer, an English singer. Um, and of 21, uh, I stopped this band because uh, I wanted to do rock and metal again. So this is where I, Kaz and I called Max back and we said, so yeah, water under the bridge, fresh ideas. Maybe we should, we should start trying to make music again together. And this is when we, we created these new materials. It wasn't merged anymore. It had something interesting I because see. of and all I, what happened. You know. Right? Yeah, I love that the metal drew you back. Like you can't ever fully really, you know, relieve yourself from the rock music world. But I've noticed in Revnor sound, you have obviously some great 
guitar rock bits and pieces in there for sure. It's got that metal aspect, but also there's a lot of electronic things in there. Is yeah. that some of that been drawn from your time spent doing the pop? Definitely, between? definitely. I I love electro, especially house and techno, um, and you know, like the dark techno vibe that I yeah. I think this is this is quite a little bit thing I like, and I try to put in in Red Noir. But yeah, I started to experiment this uh, this kind of um, this kind of electro when I was when I was doing my dark pop then yeah definitely so it comes from here for sure very cool i've just remembered there's a piece of one of your songs I remember which one but it, it has a, what i understand to be dark electro and it has a sort of pulsing kick drum like a yeah. digital kick boom, drum and it's boom, sort of yeah and it boom, sort of warps boom. around yeah, it exactly side chain. reminded me a little um, bit of um thrown by bring me the horizon there's a similar moment within that song that has oh, that. Yeah. are they an influence in yourselves at all Oh, I think we, we, we can't do metalcore today without knowing them. <laughs> I, I think they created a genre, definitely. So, of course, this is a, this is a, a band I have a lot of respect for, uh, that I listen to a lot, like I think everyone. Um, it's always, because when you do metalcore or any kind of genre of music that is like uh, around metalcore, it is difficult not to be influenced by Bring Me the Horizon because they basically created a genre uh, in my humble opinion so yeah we, we try not to of course we are getting a lot of inspiration from them but of course i'm always trying to focus so i shouldn't i must not sound like um like <laughs> remake horizon so, yeah but uh, yes definitely it is i'd say it's impossible not to have aspects of your influences to shape your sound but as long as your sound becomes a kind of co combination of all the various influences which i think yours does there's a lot of layers in there and going back to what we were talking about earlier about the electronic music side of things, how do you think about the balance between or the choices between when you're going to have a more like electronic sound to do a particular melody within a song or whether you think it's more appropriate as guitar or a vocal yeah. line? How do, you, how do you balance it? I usually go with the flow, I would say. Uh, sorry, that's not an amazing answer to your <laughs> question. But the thing I try to do also is um, I think when you think about them a very... Um, typical metalcore song you are expecting like maybe like an average in terms of intensity uh, verse then like a very powerful um, chorus with like heavy guitars then you expect to have like um, maybe a breakdown with a even more guitar and then maybe a bridge that is a little bit quieter um, so of course this is like the typical thing that you're expecting so yes most of the time i would say that we are driving by, by these natural uh, feelings but what i try to do and more and more and you will see maybe in the next songs that will be released is to get a little bit surprised i would say for the listener so maybe why not having like a very quiet electro for the chorus or the first chorus and then maybe mm. the breakdown will be way much the bridge will be way much more heavier so i sometimes try to experiment in this way but of course there's some codes i would say um but um i basically go with the flow with that yeah Cool. So it naturally emanates from what you want to do next. But yeah. I guess I, I could relate to what you're saying there is there is a, a kind of balance and a pull in two different directions where I love when you the song builds an expectation and then pays it off in an expected yeah. way. But I also love when it doesn't pay it off and it surprises you. And I don't know how to make the, I, I think I need, not that I need, but I prefer songs have a bit of both. And I guess it's the choices between whether you're going to do something completely different for the sake of doing that and whether it fits and the transition makes yeah. sense or whether actually the, to pay this off in the expected way for this part of the song makes sense, right? This is exactly that, yeah. So it's about finding a right balance of what fits the song and how much you want to surprise your audience, I would say. And I think today um, it is very complicated to um, be innovative in that core. I think a lot of things have been done and I think where you playing with a structure or playing with, you know, putting something that is, that people won't expect. This is where you can get like a, a few things. Uh, you've got some bands that do that pretty, pretty amazing. Like, of course, Sleep Token, when you, uh, when you listen to Sleep Token, for instance, there's summoning at the end, there's like some kind of jazz part, jazz, uh, jazz, jazz, do we say jazz in English? Jazz yeah, part, jazz. like a, with a bass and the piano. You, I was not expecting that in the first place. So I think. I think this is where you can like get it a bit different because all the other things, I think it, it has been made and remade and remade. So playing with the structures, um, bringing something that people won't expect. I think this is where it gets interesting. Yeah. Uh, what 
brought you to the world of metalcore is what you want to focus on now. What, why for you is that the the overall genre style, if you will, of Brave Noir that you would prefer to create to yourself? And that's that's a bloody good question. Because um, you could create it. You know, you clearly could do pop. You could do deathcore if you wanted. I'm sure. Like yeah, why why this sure. sound? Um, I think so. I I have a background with piano, classic piano, and a little bit of jazz when I was younger. Uh, then at some point I I was I fell in love with rock and roll and then heavier music with post hardcore. Basically, I I listened to post hardcore before listening to metal, like heavy metal. Uh, the band that put me into post hardcore was Under Oath. I'm sure you you might. I've know. heard of them. Uh, I've heard some of their stuff. Yeah. I think they basically created like the post hardcore genre amongst maybe other bands, but uh, yeah, they were like a big influence to me. And this is what put me into metal. And I think post hardcore um, over the years um, got a little bit heavier, so more modern guitars and, and metalcore arrived. And I think that was like quite a, um, a normal evolution for me. So, and yes, um, I think. It comes the it comes like yeah it came like with a post hardcore and then metalcore, deathcore. I'm listening to a lot of different genre of music and especially in metal, um, but I'm a little bit less into deathcore, hardcore. Um, I can listen to that, but I I don't feel a lot of things. But sometimes it's good influence also for yeah. Sure, it's different. It's kind of out there. I, I feel similarly. Like I enjoy deathcore in small doses. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can deal with a full song that's like full on deathcore, and then at the end of that, I'm like, I need something else. But I think that's where, for me, metalcore is a perfect union of you have the heaviness yeah. that deathcore can provide, but you also have the pop, and melodic, and harmonious elements that the pop world can provide that I also the, love. So it's a lovely the emo. <laughs> Emo, yeah, I mean, this is it. Well, I, when I was a teenager, I was listening to pop punk mostly. So that yeah. was what I was really into. And so there's a bit of that that I still love. And I remember listening to bands like Poison the Well, who didn't have of a course. single yeah. sung moment. It was all like screams. I was like, I can't listen to this. This is garbage. It's too, it's too much. <laughs> it's yeah. too much. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, I'm starting to get, you know, now I can enjoy a song that is fully scream vocals and nothing else. But that, I didn't ever think I'd get there. Yeah. Uh, Tell you. That was cool. How does the songwriting process go for yourselves? Do you have a principal main songwriter initially, or is it all very collaborative? <laughs> How much do you, do you all do? So 90% of the time, 90, 95% comes from me. Um, so I would say that I am the main songwriter in the band. So starting with instruments most of the time, but that's not always true. For instance, 20 milligrams, I started with a um, vocal note from Max. Like on mm. this phone, he, he sent me something with a, with the verse and then the chorus, and it, it was fun because between the verse and the chorus, it wasn't the same key, so I had to modulate oh, wow. in the former ver version. But um, we we yeah, we refined a few things. But yes, 90, 90, 95 percent of the time, it starts with me uh, with instruments. So I I would say start a lot with the guitar. Of course, in this kind of a genre music, I would say guitar is like a, one of the major instruments. But that's here also not always true sometimes it comes from a beat or um yeah um a drum pattern because uh um, yeah it i would say it it varies a lot but most of the time guitar um so yeah this is the songwriting process so most of the time i do like a first demo uh max um uh, put some tom line on that so usually it's not even english when he sings for the first time it's like a Phonetically, it sounds like English because we are right. French native, but um, yeah, we just want to make sure that the top line that we want to have on the song are fitting correctly. So we spend quite a lot of time to find the right top lines. And when the demo and the first top lines are uh, quite okay, uh, for the guitars, uh, I work with another friend sometime, um, on for Rev Noir, which is uh, it's called Pierre. Uh, he plays in a band called Novelist. Um, oh, I know them, yeah. Is an amazing guitar player. I think he's one of the, in my opinion, one of the best guitar player in the world right now. In this, at least in the genre of music, but he does jazz. He does a lot of things. So for the guitar, I like to have a second point of view or a, I don't know, a second round with him because he has ideas that I will never have. Um, That's cool. So yeah. So for the guitar, I like to to have his point of view for the guitars. And so then, yeah, the production it's basically made uh, in my in my living room uh, in my home studio. And then for the mixing part, I send that to another friend because for me, mixing is another job than some writing and producing. I personally think I don't have the level to mix my own song. 
some songs, but I think it's also it brings another color, another point of view of your. Mm. It gets the song to another, yeah, the next level. So yeah, and there is a ma- he's a ma- Lucas uh, is the mixing engineer. He does that amazingly, and um, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I think that's an underappreciated and even under aware part of the process is the mixing of it. That's a key component because it completely changes the feel of a song. It, of it, it changes the sound, not just like, well, this part's louder than the other. It, the whole sonic landscape is, is different. So it, I guess if you send it to someone else and you get, it's like an extra collaboration, right? To, Absolutely. to, to bring it out. Absolutely. And what's interesting is you said that Max mm-hmm. would write his vocal parts sometimes in a sort of phonetically English sounding yeah. thing. I interviewed a band called The Intersphere, a great German rock band. And I was asking them about their songwriting process and their singer does the same thing. He says, I sing, I write in a different language. It's not even English or German or anything. And then that shapes the, the sound sonically we want. And then you find the words to exactly. go within it. Is that how that works for yourselves? Exactly. And this is exactly the same process. I think for all people that are not a native speaker, uh, English as a native long, a native song. Um, it was a moderate song, maybe. Yeah, better. Yeah. Um, I think we quite all do that. Yeah. And mm. I asked them out of interest because it, I'm always surprised. Obviously, I'm natively an English speaker, so if I were creating music and writing songs, <laughs> it would be in English. Um, I have my French is not. I'd say adequate for some conversations, not even most. Hmm. And I was asking the industry about this, like wh- why the choice to sing in English? And their answer was that it, they didn't even consider not doing that because they've always associated English mm. as the language of rock music. It is. Is that the same for yourselves? Because I, I assumed maybe you wanted to have it more global audience was why you'd maybe go for English. But. For sure. I think when you think about rock, English comes very naturally. And, and you know, even beyond rock, it's just the sound, like the thing that you want to express when you when we sing this kind of things, like emo things, or I don't know, emo medical things, I, English is the perfect language. If you do the same thing with French, we don't have the same feeling with the same phonetic. It's very different. We tried, um, but singing 100% in French doesn't fit what we want to reflect with our songs. However, we were super proud to be French and some, in some parts, um, French could fit, um, 20 uh, milligrams least, has some French in it. Right? Yes. This is what, what we wanted to try because we, with a form of band merge, we, we forbid ourselves to using, uh, use, to use French. And for this one, why not, you know, with French, I think, um, and in this special part of the song, which was like kind of a bridge, very quiet. And what he sings is basically some kind of like a, some kind of emo poem, rap, emo poem, like it. And French was fitting quite naturally. So we wanted to experiment that. We were super scared about how people would react, but uh, really? Max was super scared. Um, I was convinced that this is just us. So at some point we just need to try it out. And, you know, we don't care what people don't care what people think. And, and even if it's, you know, if it's not really well, uh, it's not accepted, or I don't know how to, or understood by people. We would have tried something and um, it would have made like the song a little bit different but from what we used to to hear nowadays. So, but yeah, I think so far it was um, pretty well received. So I'm quite happy we did that. We might do that very soon, like in another track. Cool. Why, why were you scared for the, the response to that? What did you think people might make of that choice? I don't know, because I think metalcore and rock metal is uh, so associated with English. Um, and in, especially in France, I think there is like a very strict, um, line, I would say between like the rock bands that sing in English and the one that sing in French, Really? it's, uh, yeah, it's not even, I'm, it, of course we have one global metal scene, but, um, uh, I would say there is, there are two sub scenes. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 the, it's um, different, but, um, yeah, would one I, look down on the other for that choice or? Is it just no, I, I don't think so. I think people are quite open-minded today. It, it, I think it wasn't always the, the case. I think like when you were doing doing metal core, like in two, I don't know, two hundred, uh, in um, in fifteen or between fifteen and twenty, I think it was very, yeah, it was very driven by the US and um, and the UK maybe. And now I think it's more global. You have amazing German bands. You have an amazing scene in France right now. Also, yeah. Uh, um, so I think, yes, things have changed for good, I guess. For the good. Great. 
And back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of trying to be different and innovative and not just do the same metalcore that's been done before. I think including things like French singing within it is another way to be different and push the boat out and have your own personalities come through, right? Yeah, for sure. So I don't, I don't think, well, maybe Novelets did that. Uh, I think they have a very good song with a little bit of French. But I think at some point, yeah, it's just about what you, what do you want? What is your image? What do you, what do you want to, to put in your songs? If at some point French is like the right language, so go for it. Our, our drummer is Japanese, for instance, Kaz. And at some point I was, yeah, um, why not like putting some things in Japanese? If at some point it makes sense for you also, we can, why not? You know, it's the question is more why not, you know, instead of, yes. uh, yeah. Just to remind us, it's a creative art, right? So why would it you? Is put limitations on where you could take it, I suppose would be the question. Um, very cool. I just remember as well, Landmarks, another French band, right? And they, oh, they yeah, of a course. song yeah. recently, Creature, that they started with like a French rap and it sounded yeah. so cool. The only trick guitar is I could never do it. <laughs> so I can't even really sing along to it, but it was it was just, that sound was awesome. It worked really yeah, well. Their singer is something else. Um, th this band is like the goat, right? And they're the goats in, uh, in France and I think even like in the med course in globally, I think they're one of the best and uh, the most growing band at the moment. And yeah, the, the singer is something else. I think he, I don't know him personally, um, maybe like seen him like once or twice, but uh, uh, we didn't talk so much, but um, I think he does pretty much everything in the band, like including really? like some, the guitars, songwriting, producing, mi I think he mixes also. Wow. Um, so yeah, it, this guy is something else. And yes, he uses French like, you know, I think, he, it, obviously he's like in, into rap also and he managed to put that into yeah any kind of medical songs and uh that makes things so unique i think this is um that's amazing yeah that's very cool another great french band that i've been a big fan of the last yeah how about a year year or two is resolve resolve oh, yeah. are, are yeah. fantastic as i'm well. a big fan i'm a big fan yeah they're very good mm -hmm. I, I had a question from one of our viewers related to uh, other bands. The, the question was simply four words. It's it's from Nis. It says Rev Noir Shading Tour when. Do you know the guys in Shading in Italy, or is that a band you're familiar with? Shading. No, I don't. Okay. I don't, is, <laughs> is it? It's an Italian band. You, you, you said. Yeah, they're Italian. But I, I I assumed from the question that maybe they, they'd asked that no one that you knew that band or not. Let, let you me don't. Google it. Shading. Maybe it's just yeah. Maybe this is their ploy to get this other band on your radar. Maybe that's all that is. Oh. Um, but they're great. They're a great metalcore band from Italy. Have a look, I need to look, look it up. Yeah, I will check it out. Definitely. My question oh. would be like Rev Noir Resolve Tour went. I'd love to see that. That'd be great. Oh, I'd yeah. love to. <laughs> uh, another question from uh, one of our viewers, Nissa says, you don't appear to have a, a bassist as the main, as a main member of the band, which is uncommon, but it's becoming increasingly common, I think, in the world of rock music. What are the benefits and what are the challenges of not having a bass player? There's your live gigs. Oh, that's that's a very good question. I think there there are different reasons for that. The first is um, finding the right bandmate. Um, on top of it, so having a bandmate that plays the bass, uh, you need to get along nicely. You need to, you need to be with someone that is you know willing to work a lot because we do work a lot. Uh, somebody that's is going to be able to like to make sure he has like a, a proper gear. So you know you have a lot of constraints. And then um, also when I was songwriting and producing, the bass in Rev Noir is uh, so many layers. You know, really? it's, it's not only a bass uh, with like a, just like an acoustic electric guitar. There are so many electro on top of that. So right. also if we if we, ha if we would have a bass play, we would need like also to find where what layer would it be. So I think th this constraint is like maybe the least, the, the easiest to to, to address, but the, the, the other things, so finding the right band made that we can, that we can count on and that, you know, um, be reliable and stuff. Um, we didn't find that in time, I would say. And at some point we just stopped looking for that. <laughs> and so, yes, we were, okay, so let's start being four. I think and we started to rehearse, of course, and to play the songs and it goes very smoothly at the moment. So we will have our first uh, live shows in like, you know, we start the first, the first live show is in one month in Paris. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. But um, uh, at some point, of course, having a fifth member is also a way to add also vocals. Like if, he's, if you have mm -hmm. a bassist that sings, that brings something new for you. You have a lot of um, 
Uh, this, for instance, if Polar in, with, uh, Polaris, for instance, they have an amazing basis that also sings. Um, so yeah, that is an open question. Uh, we don't know if it's going to remain only for a four piece band or if like in the near future, we'll, we'll have also a bass player. This is a very open question. I see. So not needed as yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess it makes sense. Well, if you've got many layers that create the bass sounds of a song, it's like, well, it's not really playable by a bassist. It, it, would, it would be, you could play, you could play something, of course, like the, we always have, of course, an electric, like at least on the chorus, we always have an electric, electric bass, you I know, see. giving the, the famous killing, killings and bling, bling sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to, to say that in English. But uh, of course, uh, on top of that or around that, you have so many other things, electro things, uh, subs, uh, uh, wobbles. I don't know. I don't know. I even know how to call all these uh, these things that I add. But most of the time, there's like four or five, six layers of bass um, in my in my songs. I'm surprised to hear that you're you're doing most of this stuff yourself at home on your in your studio on your laptop or PC, whatever it is. How did you learn to do? Because it's such high quality production. I, I assume you must be in some recording studio backed by all yeah. sorts of people. How did you learn those skills? Is this a case of just going on the internet and trying some things out? I think, yeah, um, by myself, most of the, yeah, I do everything in here. Uh, I told you also like for guitars and a few, a few elements that work with Pierre also from Novelist, but we, that doesn't involve any, um, uh, amazing studios or amazing gear. It's done with like a, a lot of like very common, um, plugins and stuff. I don't, in my home studio, I think I have my, my audio device and, uh, yes, and maybe one compressor and that's. That's all. Wow. All the stuff for it, like um, your cool instruments and stuff. Yeah. And what about for vocal recordings? Do you just throw a bunch of blankets up on the wall oh, for Max? It's, it's an amazing story, this one. So for the record, we have never recorded uh, any songs, the vocals of any songs with Max sitting next to me. I will explain. So okay. we use, so we are, I'm songwriting and producing on Cubase, which is a, which is like a come, you have pro tools. We have Logic, of course, Cubase is a, is a, one of the, um, yeah. um, software that you can use on Cubase. There's an add on that you can get called VST connect, meaning that you can record with some, you can record anyone, um, long distance record recording without any latency. So what? meaning Max is. At this point, because he lives in Normandy, in Caen, uh, he doesn't live in Paris with me, in the same city. Uh, so we, he is in the studio. He connects to my session with um, this VST Connect, and we record all the vocals like this so over he, the internet. Over the internet. That's crazy. I mean, that, does it record locally to his computer and no. then send what? Exactly. It's it goes through his mic preamp is of course the audio interface and then straight to the internet on my computer in my session and the amazing thing about that because in the past we used he used to come to paris uh we we tried also to record in studios but you are feeling so stressed out that you won't have enough time right. to you know to magnify what you want so now it's just like oh um on whatsapp do you have 10 minutes i have an idea i want to find wow, something so of course cool. In one click, we're connected and we record together. That's amazing. Because also there'll be some days where like, your voice just doesn't want to do it. Exactly. Like, well, we booked the yeah. time. We have to do it today. It just is what it is. It is. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, we do that. So during the, we know that, um, and even sometimes you know, I'm traveling for work or something. I'm in like another country, another city, but I have my computer with like my audio interface. And from anywhere, you just need to have like a proper uh, internet connection. Yeah, that's the thing. That's, that's my concern would be the latency or the speed of the internet connection. Because would that not even limit though, the sound? Well, no, even though you don't have um, a proper connection, the tool that you're using, VST Connect, will like uh, compensate. I would, I would think this okay, is the yeah, word in English. Yeah. Like the There's latency. Like that, yeah, exactly. It does that. It's pretty... I'm very surprised that it is not something that is um, so mainstream or um, mm. used with like Pro Tools or Logic Pro or Ableton. But uh, I, as far as I know, Cubase is the only one that, that put that out. That's unbelievable. I mean, certainly because the only risk is what is the end quality of the audio like, but you, you have the proof in the, in the pudding is the, yeah, it's it's like, like it, the song pudding. sound like it's a very present, intimate vocal. Yeah. Um, that's actually <laughs> blown my mind. <laughs>
<laughs> but uh, you have to, you have to, I think as of today, as I think producers or like musicians in general, uh, when you do this kind of thing, you are traveling a lot, you're maybe not all the time at home. Uh, having these kind of things is like super handy, I think. Oh yeah. The benefits seem, seem obvious. And the, if, <laughs> if the only negative is not actually a negative, which is the quality of the recording itself, then it's all benefits. That's really exactly. cool. Well done. Another thing on the lines of the vocal world, I think this is the first song I heard of Rev Noir's was Bang Bang. And I was in, when a song opens, like, this is great overall sound, I'm liking this. And then there was a little pause and a little breath. And it went the next thing. And at that point, I went, oh, these guys are serious. They're not fucking around. There's details. What inspired that breath in that moment? Can you remember what the intention was there and, and how they yeah, came about? Yeah, definitely. So I'm responsible for that. So this is the that you yes. hear at the beginning. Yeah. So, um, in the first version that I've, uh, produced, uh, it wasn't a breath. It was like some kind of glitch that was doing something like that. Right. And the guy said, we've heard that so many, like in so many songs, maybe hmm. we could try something else. So just to have a laugh, I just recorded a in my SM seven, like in my, in the mic. And then I pitched it with like, to pretend that this is a little feminine, I would say. It did. Like, I thought it sounded like a feminine a little, breath. I don't yeah. know how, but. So I pitched it a little. So you play with the pitch of the foreman in like you know, basic vocal processing tools. And then it, it did that and we, we left it. This is as, uh, yeah. Ah, such That's a cool a detail. And it comes back once again later on after I think the chorus is kind of. Um, yeah, I think after the first chorus, when we have this, uh, this riff that is basically like the main riff, uh, when there is like a little, yeah, a little blank, I would say, and you have the breathing in the blanks. That's such a cool detail. Very nice. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know how that came about. In terms of the overall. I guess intention message. I tend to focus more on the sonic things that are going on in music and less on lyrical content. Sometimes they cut through. But is there an overall core, I guess, message that Rev Noir is trying to deliver through their their music, or is it general commentary on the human condition? What what is your overall core message if you have one that comes to the songs? So I think I think for that I would be more relating to the lyrics. I would say I, I am Max for the first song that we released has a main theme that is following, and this is all part of the grieving. The, sorry, the grieving steps. So um, aggressivity um, when you are denying things. Um, I don't know all the steps by heart. That's a shame. <laughs> but okay. um, there are five steps of grieving, if I'm correct. And all the songs, every single songs, every song are related to one of the step. Um, bang bang is like the aggressivity, like, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's okay. the story behind that. I think, so that's the yeah. concept for the first series of songs, I suppose. Yes. For the, at least the, the five, the five, the first, the five first songs. Um, the fifth one is going to be released in a few weeks. It's ready. We have finalized Exciting. a few things. And this is the, that's, that would be the last part. Okay. So would you, I mean, people, the definitions of these seem to change. Would that be an EP or is that a mini album? Um, what, what do you call it? So th that's, so we didn't even think about that. And I know that okay. it, we, 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 we've seen this question so much recently. And of course, every time we release a new songs, uh, a new song, sorry, we, we, we put also like the other ones, you know, in the same, you know, on Spotify or like in, in yes. kind of an audio platform. So when released the, the fourth song, so Invincible, it was like packed, um, as an EP. So people, oh, so it was an EP. It, it was not. So I think, um, the last one that we're going to release is eventually going to close and it's going to close like the five songs that we had in mind of, I think it's going to be an EP, but, um, we, it depends what you, what EP means. We, I don't know. We're not going to have like any special event or any special, like, uh, yeah, Release it's just going to be like, um, an aggregation of the five songs. Um, so we've already like, um, written all the materials for what's coming next. I don't even know if it's going to be an EP or an album or whatever. I think when you, this is my opinion. And this is of course very challengeable when you start a new band, uh, if you release an album too quickly, I think it can, can be like a lot of effort for um, not so many gain because 
Mm-hmm. Um, most of the time, people will listen to one, two free singles if you're lucky, and you will eventually have seven, eight tracks that will be like a little bit more in the shadow and mm-hmm. might just be wasted. Um, or um, so I guess when you start, and at least this is what we try to do, is maybe it's a little bit better that to ensure frequency, frequency releasing tracks like um, every six, eight weeks, I don't know, 10 weeks, that could be like a good, uh, a good timing. And when you have a proper uh, fan base and people are starting to expect a few things, this is maybe the time where you, you could think about something like that more consistent or a bigger EP or LP. Or, yeah. I've never thought of it that way before, but it makes total sense because every mm. song takes a similar amount of effort to yeah. write and record and do all yeah. that stuff. And if it's for a big album that, yeah, maybe only a few people are aware of, then those songs might get lost in the mix a little bit. And I'd, I'd, exactly. I think we're living in a bit more of a modern world where I don't know, is my opinion here, that we necessarily need albums. And this is a it's, controversial opinion. Some people really I love know. an album. Mm. You know, it depends on the band, I think. If you have a very conceptual delivery of a few songs over an arc, and in this case of the grieving steps, I could see why that would be, you know, bucketed together in that way. But I, I love the idea of just as soon as you have a song, I want it. <laughs> like whatever it is, it doesn't have to be part of an overarching thing. Just like I, songs and drips and drabs. And then I get to pay all of my attention to each song as they live in their own universe. And I, I love that as a listener, yeah. frankly. No, definitely. And um, it, this is, uh, yeah, I think that's the uh, $1 billion question. Uh, should we do any P or singles or uh, LP? Uh, I think there is no, I think that there is no, best answer to that, to be honest. It depends on your strategy, it depends on, yeah, the, I think I completely agree sometimes. Um, I, I, I personally see an album as a story, like uh, with mm. beginning and then it brings you to some places and then, you know, it, it closes at some point. Um, but also today, people, the way people consume music is a, is a little bit different from like 10 or 15 years ago. 100%. You know, when we, um, you know, for uh, for instance, when I was starting to listen to music, of course, there was with MP3, MP3 crisis, and like a lot of things were, were happening in the music industry. I presume you had this little, you know, key USB key with like we all had like the same songs, you know, like Radiohead, Muse, uh, or Metallica, and we so we didn't have so much choice. You know, we were listening to the same music over and over again. Yes. Now the way people consume music is a little bit more with like with um, streaming platforms. We have playlists and stuff, and mm. this is made for you to discover new artists with you know the algo that is uh, kicking in uh, behind. So you, the experience you have with music is more uh, focused on maybe discovering music or singles one after one. Then yeah. maybe listening to an album, which would be, I think, your own decision. I want to listen to an album from beginning to the end, and this is my decision. If you are getting driven by um, the algo, I would say, by the platform, it will push you like a lot of different things. So yeah, I think that's the thing that I'd like to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking about it now and questioning myself. I think that I can see two reasons mainly why you'd have an album. One is if it is a story arc that you want to write a few songs to build to, that makes total sense, an artistic point of view. But I suspect it's also somewhat related to what we we're talking about before about your ability to now record over the internet, the vocals. Like if you only had a limited time to get everyone together, then all right, let's make the use of the studio. Let's write and record 12 songs, do them all at once. And then those songs exist. So you're like, well, let's put them all out at the same time. Maybe it's like a traditionalist thing that why albums exist. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just idea, yeah. musing on it. Uh, one question it's, I was I was curious about, the, the name Rev Noir, now my limited French would tell me, Rev is about sleep and Noir is black. What is it, is it in French, is it black sleep? What's the concept of the, the name about? Yeah, that would, that would translate uh, into um, dark, um, yeah, dark dream, I would say, dream. Rev is dream. Hmm. Um, so um, when, we spent quite a lot of time to find uh, the name of the band. Um, we wanted something that is uh, easily found on, on the internet, especially on the internet. What, with our former band, which was called Merge, was super complicated. <laughs> of course, Merge, you have so I looked many, them uh, up as I prepared for uh, this. Like, There's a few artists called Merge, I think. That's tricky. Yeah, yeah. and then, I don't know, you can merge a lot of things you know, around yeah. you. Um, so I think when I was typing Merge, you find how to merge two cells in Microsoft Excel most of the time. <laughs> so it's not very easy to find your band. So for Revmore, we wanted to find something that 
sounds a little bit like French, but it can be easily pronounced in English mm. and make something short and something that represents our, um, you know, the kind of atmosphere we have. So quite dark, quite, um, emotional. Yeah. So that was like the, the, the pitch I would say when we started to, so what I did is, uh, we, we opened an Excel file that we put like a lot of different ideas and we came up with, um, Rêve Noir, but with, with the e, Rêve in English, in French, it's R-E-V-E. -E. Yes. E yeah. And so we just removed the, we contracted like, um, we removed the E. I don't know. It's more, it's cooler. Somehow. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and yeah, we, and this is where, how we came up with that. <laughs> I just thought in my head, what if that's what took 18 months is figuring out what is going to be the name? That's oh, one of the hardest things to do is figure out That's the name. last thing we did. We, we, we wrote like, um, I don't know, um, multiple songs before even think, oh, we forgot to find a name. And I think we, this is, I think the last thing that we, we, we focused on. So, oh yeah, if we want to release that on September 1st, we need a name. So I think wow. we found a name in July, something like this. Uh, that reminds me of when I was in university and starting a band and we had our first gig before we had a name. I think at the gig, we called ourselves like, we need a name, uh, <laughs> you know, suggest a name. And our buyer, the second gig, we had a name, which was called Make It Better Later, which is very much in keeping was like, we'll just figure it out later. Let's just, we just play a gig. We'll just write a song. We'll, we'll make it better later on. Don't worry about it. That's good. Yeah. That's a good one. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, what is your favorite guitar part to play in Revnor songs that have been released uh, thus far? Do you have one? That's a good question. I think that would be the breakdown in 20 milligrams. Okay. Um, for different reasons, because um, I think first because it's super heavy, and I think um, it's it. I think it's related to how we build up to this breakdown. It's like super fast on the drums and stuff, and then we have something's happening that I think you are the only one who. Uh, figure out what was happening when I was looking at your reaction, by the way, okay. you got that we are, as, uh, sh we are changing the signature of the song. It's like, it's three, four before, uh -huh. and then it's four, four. When the breaks down, when the breakdown hits, it's four, four, four by four. Right. And, um, I like the way the intent, the build the intensity is building up to this part. And when the four, four is hitting, um, yeah, it's, it, it gives more space. It's super heavy. And we have also these whammy a pedal that are you know like um, uh, pitching uh, pitching mm. the sound of the guitars it brings like a lot of dirt i think in the sound uh, for all these reasons i think this is like one of the best parts i, I like to play and uh, i'm really looking forward to playing that part in a uh, live i think it's going to take another dimension i guess yeah i wonder as you've not played a, a live gig in this band yet i imagine most of your playing of the guitar is probably sat down with the guitar in your lap so have you been practicing standing up yeah. playing these riffs Okay, it's good. It's a good question. And I, I was I, at one point because, of course, I was practicing a lot. And we started to to rehearse a month and a half ago. Right. Only. Yeah. Um, because I spent quite a lot of time to build uh, the setup of what we needed. And it took like a shitload of time. Uh, <laughs> it's and um, I wanted something that is very like um, plug and play. Uh, but to achieve that, you need quite a lot of time, a lot of thinking. And, and programming and stuff, but uh, I, I do like that. But anyway, yes, we started to rehearse uh, months ago. We rehearsed like twice a week, not all the time uh, with all the bandmates. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, we can't be all there, but Kaz and I, we do, we live in Paris. We are, our, we have all studio, our studio in Paris. So we, at least us, um, we rehearse twice a week. And yes, I'm playing like standing up because otherwise it's very not the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Has that presented some challenges? Are there particular licks that are quite difficult to play standing up or moments where in the rehearsals you're realizing, oh, this is actually going to take a few bits of yeah, practice of to course. get this right? Of course. Yes. There's some part that needs to be very tight. And uh, of course, it's not the same when you're standing up and like moving and being on stage. You don't want to be like a little too much too static, I would say. So you won't try to move a little bit, but uh, it messes everything up. So yeah, it's a lot of practicing and know when you can move when you need to stay still. Uh, but I would say also for uh, the guitars, I have programmed the, um, all the effect changes. With oh, MIDI. nice. So we don't have any, in any, we don't have to switch anything. Like we don't have any foot switch or, or anything. For even, the even the aforementioned whammy thing, is that not? No, everything wow. is programmed. That's good. Everything. Otherwise you're on the wrong side of the stage and you go, uh Oh, I need my pedal. It's no. over there. 
it's everything is premium. I spent quite a lot of time to do that, but we have, uh, we send a MIDI signal to the, um, to our um, uh, profiler. So it, it, it's a quad cortex. This is basically like the, the, the digital guitar amp that is the most used, I think today. And with these, these MIDI impulses, it changes your effect. So you can like just focus on playing, like moving that's on so stage. Cool. And it, it I changes never everything. had that. Oh man, that sounds amazing. Cause I, I, it's a long time since I was playing guitar in a band, but yeah, I'd have a, a foot switch on the floor and inevitably sometimes I'd hit the wrong fucking switch and then like it <laughs> yeah. goes clean. I'm like for a breakdown, I'm like, oh, for God's sake. Um, and yeah, then you're and just that, pushing it. Like which pedal was it? That's oh awful. yeah. And that can't happen. I think with what, what we play, we need a whammies, for instance, to be like very precise. So if mm. it's like a, like a quarter of bars, like late or before it, it messes everything up. So this way, no problem. Do you have a favorite component of a metalcore song that you're excited to get to or to include into a song? For example, is it all about the breakdown for you or is it about setting up the tone at the start of a song or is it how can we deliver a chorus that's got some punch? Is there one aspect that you particularly focus on yourself? Well, it's, it's a good question. I think it depends on the song. Um, if I take our songs, like the, the four ones that have been released, um, it will be different from every for every single one of them. Um, what is sure is that we pay a lot of attention to the chorus for mm -hmm. sure. Um, on both on the instrument part and on the vocals, of course. So it's always like quite, um, uh, quite something. I think for 20 milligrams, we recorded more than 100 choruses. What? Before five, yes. More than 100. What? Yeah. It was, we were. It was driving us How crazy. How could you even choose within 100? Well, I, uh, I like number 47, but number 60 yeah. was pretty good. Like that's... And some of them were like a mix of other ones. And uh, we spent so much time with uh, with Max. Um, but I told you like at the beginning of the uh, of the interview, at the beginning we were modulating, so meaning changing the key when we were going from the verse to the chorus. So it was not so natural in terms of flow then we i changed the key so to have the same key in the chorus the same as the one that we have in the verse so other ones and so yeah we went through so many different phases and um but yes we weren't satisfying the good thing about when we record when we record voices with um with max we know when we're going to be both satisfied we know okay. and most of the time so we finish the session so i send I send the expert, the expert to everyone. So we listen to that. We sleep on that. And the next day I tell Max, I'm not convinced. And 99% uh, of the time, me neither. So we both feel it when, uh, when it's the good one. And is that just a feeling or do you have any way of quantifying what that difference uh, maker is to know, no, we can push this further. We try to quantify that, but uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's a feeling basically, it's for sure. For sure, it's a feeling. For instance, like the the track we're going to release in a few weeks, um, the first shot that we gave at the chorus is the one you will listen, you will hear. It okay. was only one. This is the first shot, in, in, and we were okay. This is the top line. No, no question, on, wow. no question asked. So it could be, it can be so different. So I think this is the first time that on, only the first, the the first shot only is like the one that we that we keep. But for the other for the other songs, we record like at least like 20 or 50 i would say at least 20 or 30 different courses every time that's incredible but it speaks yeah. to how high the quality is if you are going through that many kind of iterations to try and perfect it and hone it to something you think is the best it can be then it's worth the effort and you can feel that on the other side as a listener like this is this has been yeah. honed and thought about and considered um, but it's got it's a lot of effort invested i mean i come from when i was in yeah. writing music for bands is pop punk so like, it didn't have to be that precise and special and well layered. It's like, ah, fuck it, it's a guitar riff. Here's a chorus that'll do next. Uh, so that's that's quite a disciplined way of, of doing it. Have you always been a very disciplined person yourself in other aspects of your life? Or is it when it comes to music, you really pay that extra attention? Yeah, I, I guess I, the, the, this genre of music is, um, I think is, um, it's quite demanding because the, produ the production that you hear on a regular basis in this kind of, in the genre of music is quite high, I would say. Yes. I think one of the highest, um, um, a lot of things, a lot of layers. Um, so yeah, it can be like a little bit complex, but, um, yeah, I would say, I think we're driven by what we want. This is the first thing. Then of course, what, when we look around us, the, 
production level is like quite high. So we need also yeah. like to to be at the same. And yeah, and I would say Max and I are naturally like um, um, quite picky, and we we like to do things like we want things to be neat and yeah. But I don't have think. To. Yeah, and I don't think many people really understand how difficult it is to produce something that is multi-layered with guitars and other instrumentation that doesn't just sound like mud like mm -hmm. the, you have to be careful about the frequencies that it it takes yes. up in the spectrum so it's not all coming out of all the frequency it just sounds like trash like if anyone said oh he's doing this at home on his laptop i can do the same good luck like it's mm -hmm. actually takes a ton of effort to make that work yeah it's a lot of time it's like dialing the right guitar tone is like super complicated and when even when I'm sending like the guitars, I'm not re re recording so many guitars, one left, one right, um, some voicings sometimes, or some layers. But uh, when I send the guitars to um, to Lucas, to the mixing engineer, um, the tone is already made. So is it just has to like push a little bit of an EQ and making sure it, it's like at the right level, but uh, we mm. craft the sound of, get, of the guitars quite a lot also. Mm. Do you have a favorite part of the band process anything from songwriting or the recording process or playing mm. live or the, the other things that go around it do you have a, you have a preferred aspect yeah I, I would say that everything that is in between s uh, writing songs and producing songs and playing on stage i don't like that <laughs> so all the uh, i know it's super important and uh, uh, the good thing is that we have um the guys in the band do that amazingly like robin and max are very good with the social networks and stuff i'm not good at that and i i don't like that um i like to be like a little bit more in the shadow um like the you know like the geeky the nerd like doing things writing things and for me yeah i like to to do the songs uh, produce songs and doing like the songs we love and then playing them on stage uh, this is a the, when i write songs and produce songs i always try to imagine what it, what kind of emotion what what i would do if i would play that on stage what it would give you know to what mm. the people would think so i like to write songs this way so these songs are made to be played on stage this is a genre of music that is um i think that you want to sh it's a music that you want to share with people this is the way i i i am I, um, I feel that but yes everything in between i would say not to me i try to do it a little <laughs> but um it's so complicated yeah yeah, everyone's got their preferences in my world. Yeah. I enjoyed, well, I enjoyed writing songs, but mostly it was all about playing live. And certainly, as you alluded to there, this kind of music is about energy. You want to throw that through loudspeakers live into an audience and feel that, I think. Uh, that makes sense. Definitely, definitely. Do, um, so what, what's, what's on your kind of musical bucket list that you'd like to do with this band do you have a, an idea of the arc that you'd like to take rev noir or is it very much a you know create and see and push it forward and see where it goes gradually yeah i would say option two uh, we try to not ask ourselves uh, too many questions i think if you at one point we all do that as a band i think asking yourself if people are going to like the songs and i think if uh, i don't know if you know attract uh, the attention of like professionals in the music industry we all tend to do that as musicians but i think um it's good in some proportion to think about that but i think you should be mainly driven by what you what you like um if people relate to that you're lucky if they don't at least you do something that is uh, that is that you like and we this is where we don't ask, ask ourselves our question and when we started Rev Noir, um we looked at each other's like in, in the eyes and we said the only thing there is only one mantra with uh, with this band we want to do the music that we love first um we will never release a track that we that we don't feel it's us or that we don't all collectively like um this is the only thing we try to to pay attention to and yeah it's all about like making the music we like I guess all the things on top of that, if like people relate to these songs, like, of course, it's amazing to see like um, the feedback, people listening to the tracks or reacting, all the reactions. Thank you, by the way, <laughs> from the from the bottom of my heart, it's helping a lot. And um, it's it's amazing. But um, I think, yeah, you should always like stay focused on what you what you love. And like, yeah, your um, I would say, yeah, your personal um, 
love for your music. I would say that's the main driver, driver for us. That sounds very healthy because I imagine that one of the difficult things in the current modern universe where reaction channels exist, such as my own, there's a, there's not a guarantee that they're going to like the stuff and it, it could, course. it could that's affect fair. how you see yourself and your songwriting and the music. Like it's a, but it's as long as you have the mindset of it, it's a subjectivity thing. And if you Absolutely. can be pleased with what you're doing and why you're doing it, then actually anything else is kind of whatever. If it helps to for create sure. some awareness, great. But if they're not digging it, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not for them, you know, for sure. But from my standpoint, I, I, I'm not, I mean, you know, I, it's going to seem, it's going to be a strange thing to say, but I'm not doing what I do generously in a way. Like I'm not pretending to like stuff. I'm not trying cool. to like help new bands get an audience. I'm selfishly looking for yeah. the best music I can find for my yeah. picks, basically. And the reason that I've been, I've done, I think, I, yeah, my channel is one for every song we've done so far is because I think they're all of really high quality overall. The songwriting is interesting and yet satisfying and familiar, has the, the kind of balance of the sounds that I like and has a passion and energy. And it's just fucking phenomenal. I'm very excited to hear the next song and the final one in this catchment as it it's comes out off. soon. It's, um, yeah, I think the next one is a little bit different from the other ones. So yeah, this this one is surprising. I will send it to you if you if you like right after Please, the, yeah. the interview. You loved it. Yeah. Can't wait. Well, thank you very much, Julian. It's been fascinating to find out a bit more thank about so Rev Noir and the songwriting and the production side. You've genuinely blown my mind more than twice uh, in terms of the production because I'm out of the loop with kind of producing things from the last decade plus. So that's so cool. I'm gonna look up Cubase. Because I've been using Ableton, the Cubase, that sounds like an amazing thing. Not that I have a singer to record over the internet, but anyway, very cool to know about that. So thank you again for your time. Good luck with the next song and the first gig coming up as well. Are you going to film that at all or um, is that just to do? I, I think, yes, we were just talking about that because, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if we're going to do like a very professional, like a live um, with like multiple cameras and stuff, but um, we are thinking about like recording something. Capture yeah, the because, moment at the very least in some form. I will try to. Thank you so Great. much for your um, for your time, for having me, and for all your reactions. Thank you so much. It's helping a lot of artists right now. You're very welcome. Thank you for saying so. That's very kind. Well, cheers. Yeah, I look forward to the next song. Best of luck. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to that discussion with Julianne from Revnor. As much as I enjoyed having it, they're a really exciting up-and-coming band, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing more from them. Check out their music on all the usual streaming platforms and their music videos on YouTube as well. And we can look forward to a new song at some point in the next few weeks at time of this recording. So, all very exciting. Thank you for watching this or listening to this on whatever podcast network you're using. Do feel free to subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube or... Maybe uh, follow it on the platforms that you happen to be checking this out on. In the description of this episode, you should find a link to a Discord server if you want to come and chat to me about the podcast or maybe recommend some other people you think I should be reaching out to for future episodes. That would be great. Thanks again, and perhaps you'll check out another episode sometime soon.